Welcome to First Federated Church's online video podcast of this week's sermon. First Federated Church is based out of Des Moines, Iowa. Please visit www.firstfederated.org for more information. <laughs> oh, stop. Well, I'm, I, I'm what I didn't expect to be, and which is emotional about this moment. But you never know what you have till you lose it. Amen. And uh, 52 days ago, I fell off my bicycle uh, dra- dramatically and uh, landed in the hospital for 17 days. And uh, do you know? Every day, 52 days in a row, somebody, sometimes dozens of somebodies, from this fellowship was in my hospital room or in my living room ministering to me. And I would, it would be very dangerous if I were to start calling out individuals. I know I burned through two boxes of thank you notes, and if you haven't got yours yet, it's, it's, it's on its way, I think. But one person I really want to say thanks and acknowledge before all of you who stepped up and delivered above and beyond the call of duty is uh, our dear brother Tom Hefner. Where are you? Right there. Everybody, please thank him for, for me and... Uh, He stepped up into two very important business functions for all of us in rental agreements and things that I uh, just thank you, uh, brother, for your class and generosity and Christlikeness uh, to me and to uh, my wife. And uh, she'll be here in the next service and uh, something I want to say about her uh, then. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, oh, there it is. Um, yeah. But uh, just a huge thank you to, to every uh, one of you. Um, for being Jesus to me. See, my name's Thomas, and I got to see the nail prints a lot. And I did, just about every day, to the point that I can tell you without trying to be really pious or, or super, you know, spiritual or something. But this trial really was a gift that I thank God for. And I, a set of lenses that I can see His glory through that I couldn't before. And one of the things I see now is the family of faith that you've, be, you've moved way, way past being my employer, way, way past being a church I serve to being the family that I'm a part of. So thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. And be patient with me as I try to get back. We'll be easing back into things. But one of the things, that one of the blessings was that we could all sort of stay connected by way of the, uh, you know, the wonders of the Internet of Facebook. And, you know, uh, how many of you have or use Facebook? Let's see your hands. All right. That's the lion's uh, share. Uh, It's, you know, because then I could tell the story once and then everybody got it. And I could put the gory pictures on there once and all. Well, Facebook was, was, is, if you're unfamiliar, it's this thing, it's like an internet inside the internet, and it's also sort of an online high school reunion where you get together and show people how wonderful or tragic your life uh, is. But it was all cooked up by the boy genius, Mark uh, Zuckerberg. And he designed it first to just keep his campus, college campus buddies uh, connected uh, at, at his school, and it, which then blossomed to the rest of the world. And today there are more than one billion Facebook uh, users, and when his company went public, it was the largest initial public offering on the stock market in history, and today his estimated net worth is somewhere in in excess for this idea of $34 billion. Now, with this new millennium, millennium has come the phenomenon, then, of social media. Incredible, isn't it? Uh, The ability for all of us to stay connected, know what's going on in each other's lives. But with it has come a whole new set of behaviors and ethics. That's right. In the online social media world, Facebook 
In particular, you can connect with all of your friends and other people who are into the same things that you're into. And you can join various groups in Facebook and be in various mailing lists in Facebook. And in short order, you can be connected to hundreds, if not thousands. And if you check mine, more than 4,000 of my very best friends in the whole world are right there. Yeah. And now in the real world, in the real world, you have to learn how to get along with people you don't agree with, who hold differing values than you, who, who disagree on sensitive subjects like politics or religion or arts and so forth. But not so, not so in the netherworld of uh, social media, in the netherworld of Facebook. On Facebook, when you begin to feel tension uh, or disagreement, or bad vibes of, of any kind, if they upset you or whatever and you want to call it, you just remove them from your life by click and you unfriend them. <laughs> click. Or if you're really sly, you just no longer follow them. And it's simple and it's anonymous. They don't get a note saying that you unfriended them. They just find out that you're no, they're no longer part of your world. And when they go to your website, it says we're no longer friends and uh, your, your page and so now you, you only have to hang with people that agree with you and you them who have the same likes same dislikes same politics same religion same hobbies same all that kind of stuff but when you think about it in, in many ways that really is a reflection of the direction that our society is going we are all this way to one degree or another, we are prone to only hang out with people with whom we do agree, only listen to the news, advice, counseling, and even doctor's orders, which agree with our preset ideas, and that's called confirmation bias, and every human being has it, so that we naturally dis exclude people from our lives who are different from us or who hold different views. And it's so strong and it's so pervasive that we don't even need a reason to do so without thinking uh, uh, about it and no relationship is immune from this unfriending. Even the most intimate of relationships, which our text is going to talk about this morning, of marriage, which has been all over the news in this last weekend. We'll get to that in, in, in just a moment. But for example, do you know in the great state of Iowa, how many of you were born in Iowa? See the uh, Iowa natives, okay, look at that. Me too. In the great state of Iowa, you no longer need a reason to file for and be granted a divorce. And that's right, Iowa Code section 598.5 and 598.17 say, allege that there has been a breakdown of the marriage relationship to the extent that the legitimate objects of matrimony have been destroyed and there remains no reasonable likelihood that the marriage can be preserved and click, just say it's so, file the necessary papers, pay the necessary fees, and it's over. I read of one attorney who was offering a special of only $99. Here's the kicker, the offer was good only on February 14th, <laughs> Valentine's Day. Yeah, we laugh. We laugh because of the tragedy and the irony. Instead of sticking it out and working it out, we just click and unfriend. And it happens also, tragically, in our churches. Instead of hashing it out and respecting each other and living inside the tensions of family life together as a body of believers, when we come to an impasse, we choose all too often to simply walk away from each other. To offer no reconciliation, to part company, and give rise to one of the fastest growing segments of unchurched America, which is unchurched Christians. Every single one of you is on a first name basis with someone who has a bright living relationship with Jesus Christ, but no relationship whatsoever to this or any church at all. And even more, who did, but now find themselves part of another fellowship in this city because of relational differences. 
choosing to part company rather than to work out the differences, offenses, or hurts, seeing the tension itself as something that is bad rather than an opportunity for both parties to grow. And it's into this very real conversation that Jesus Christ steps with our passage today and his upside down kingdom that we've been learning about this spring. A kingdom that where if you want to become great, become the least. A kingdom where if people mistreat you, we're commanded to love them. That if they demand to carry their load a mile, carry it for them two miles. That if they want to borrow, instead give without expecting ever to be paid back. Where if you're mistreated, give your blessing. Where you're offended, be quick to give. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. And obviously, inverted, counterintuitive, upside-down kingdom compared to our world's standards. And now he throws down in our text this morning these words, Matthew 5, verses 31 through 32. And it's been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, anyone that divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful to you that your word by every passing minute becomes more relevant to the world we live in today. And the sharpening, darkening contrast between light and dark in our society. Thank you that you unreservedly, unabashedly, unashamedly speak to every need that we have. Because you came here to earth in physical form in your son Jesus. You bore our sorrows, our burdens. You were tempted in every way. You identify with us through and through. You speak truth to us and lead us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Today, may your kingdom grow in our hearts, in our families, our neighborhoods, this fellowship, and the world. I pray, God, for, through my feeble attempt this morning, you would speak to our hearts. You would accomplish what you need accomplished. You would bless. You would edify. You would correct. You would rebuke. You would train in all righteousness. You would draw lost people to you. And help us to gain what we need to be more like you when we leave this room than how we were when we came into this room. This we pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And together, God's people said, Amen. Let me pause for a second, underline one of the announcements that, that John made about the Beaverdale Fall Festival. One of the things we really need a key volunteer to take over the float construction, building the float, key. People have done that, have done it for years on end, and they kind of said, we need a break. If that's something that you would just love to try to do, uh, please see Sherry or myself uh, as soon as possible. All right, let's fly through this as fast as we possibly can. Jesus is showing us right here in the middle of his sermon that relationships, that human, the relationships of human beings starting with marriage and going on down are never to be disposable. No clicking, no unfriending, no, well, I'm just not very happy. I'm getting anything out of this. None of that, and no kidding, none of that. Serious stuff right here. He's one-upping the crowd, and in particular, the religious bigots in the crowd, the Pharisees and teachers of the law that were there in the initial group standing there hearing the sermon. Because you see, in that day, there were two schools of thought when it came down to marriage and divorce. The first school was the, the, the most very religious. Uh, it was the school of Hillel, which said if, you're, if, if a wife burnt your supper or put too much soup, salt in your soup, uh, or if you simply saw a woman you thought was more attractive than the woman you were married to, all you had to do was give her a piece of papyrus or piece of parchment with essentially the words, you are divorced from me, and voila, it was all over. 
No surprise, in those days, women were viewed just a little step above slaves or cattle. They were viewed as property of their husband. And that school said that property could be disposed of with little or no consequence to yourself. Then there was the other school, the school of Shammai. Sounds like a name of a killer whale or something at SeaWorld, Shammai, which said divorce was only permissible in the case of sexual unfaithfulness. Then and only then, if you wanted to, there was the possibility of divorce. Didn't have to, though, though there was one school that said you must, only if you wanted to, but not for any other reason. Now, this subject is so vast and so deep, there's no way we can cover all of it in one brief message. I'm going to do my best. Because I know what you're thinking. You, you might be thinking, hey, Tom, he's taking a pretty hard line here. I mean, marriage is oftentimes a very complicated thing. How many of you would agree with me? Marriage is a complicated thing. Raise your hands. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> and look, I have my whole life ahead of me. And you, you don't understand. He or she is robbing me of my happiness. I can't tell you as a pastor how many times I've heard that. She or he is robbing me. If you don't hear anything, I want you to hear this this morning. I think Tim Keller might have been the one who said it first. But know this. The purpose of marriage is not to make you happy. It is to make you holy. Now that's some strong medicine. It might come to a shock to you. Because see, in our society, personal happiness seems to be the highest of ideals. I want you to know something. God didn't wake up this morning. Yeah, I know he doesn't sleep or slumber, just to make the point. Uh, your day, his day did not begin with your happiness as his number one agenda item. I can hear my popularity just dropping. There's all those warm fuzzies. He got hurt, but now, now we're past that because he's gone way past pre preaching and he's meddling. Well, come on, Tom. You're telling me that God wants me to be unhappy? Of course not. But he does show us through his teaching on the kingdom that real, lasting peace, love, joy, contentment, yes, even happiness, is never the result of having gone after those things directly. They are instead the result of having gone after something else directly. And as he'll say in a chapter later in Matthew 6.33, but seek first his kingdom and, all these, and his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, live in the kingdom and you will find the wherewithal to a happier, more fulfilling life and, yes, marriage. Really? Really, Tom? Is it, is it that simple? Yes, it is that simple, but that does not mean that easy. You want heaven on earth to be in your marriage? Well, start here. Don't think too highly of yourself and put your spouse first. Keep a faithful eye towards your spouse and not anyone else. Be quick to ask for forgiveness and live a life that is constantly turning back to the Father. Trust Jesus with all of your hopes and your dreams and your heartaches and your disappointments. Abandon power as to who's in charge and instead serve with humility and develop an appetite and a thirst to hunger and thirst after God. To be above and all merciful. To be pure in heart. And this means your thought life. Be a peacemaker. In other words, be like Jesus. It's a pathway to a better marriage. But one important note. 
you know, you read off a list like that and thinking can go really sideways because whenever the Bible gives us instructions on how we are supposed to live, please listen, it is not so that living that way you might be saved. It is rather living that way because you are saved. Do you see the enormous difference? Jesus' teaching of the kingdom does not become a new kind of law. It's the fulfillment of the law, and that's a very important difference that will put light on our motivation. We don't know these things so God will owe us. We do these things because we see the enormous cost that the grace of God and the salvation we've been given have come to the Father, and we will want, and it melts us, and we will want to lovingly follow Him. But then why does he take such a hard line on this issue in our lives? Because, friends, marriage between a man and a woman irrespective of the law of the land You know, God is love, but love is not God. Remember that. Marriage is a picture to the whole watching world of the love of Jesus Christ for His church. It's the dog-eared New Testament that people have the opportunity to read. In how you treat each other is probably the loudest confession or witness that you have. This is my story. Dear friends of our family, Cap and Sandy Ridgeway, how they treated each other proved to me the gospel was true. Doesn't make sense, but if you're in my shoes, it did. Because when we, who deserved to be given a certificate of divorce from God Almighty and to be thrown out of the kingdom, when we, despite all of our unfaithfulness, despite all of our selfishness, despite all of our wickedness, perverse ways, and wanting a divorce from Him, instead, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. When we deserved divorce, we got a honeymoon instead. When we jumped off the cliff, he hit the rocks below. Tom, you're oversimplifying it. It's not that simple. It's much more complicated. You have no idea, Tom, what she or he has done to me, said to me, done to my kids. You're right, I don't. It's a mess. It's complicated. But here's what's not complicated. Marriage is to be a permanent, lifetime, one-time covenant before Almighty God to faithfully wed one man to one woman forever. For those who are in Christ. Forever. And the key to that is trusting God with all of your complications, with all of your issues, with all of your sin, with all of the mess that it is, and accepting the fact that He accepts you despite all of the mess, all of the complication. He then gives you and the entire watching world around you a picture of His love in your spouse who gives you the opportunity to accept another person just as thoroughly as He accepts you. Because, listen, the bottom line is that, sadly, most divorces are due to the symptoms of a troubled relationship, not the actual problem. Because oftentimes the problem is thinking that another person is the source of your happiness or the source of your unhappiness. And whenever you make 
another person or another thing other than Almighty God, your source, you are in big trouble. Your spouse, your kids, your boss, your job, your friends, your portfolio, your vacation house, your skills, your abilities, your talents. Look, the trouble is none of them are as good as any of those things might be. They simply cannot bear the weight of the human soul. And therefore, in the end, are going to end up leaving you even more wanting, more hungry, more hurting, thirsty, frustrated, angry, blind, alienated, imprisoned, and alone. But all too often we go into marriages believing this person will satisfy all of my wants, all of my dreams, my needs, my desire in life. But guess what? As amazing as he or she might be, they can't. Because you and I have been purposed, built, so that the only way our souls can ever be satisfied is in a relationship with our Creator. Divorce was and never is God's intention. And you can do everything legally, but it doesn't mean we've done anything right. Now here's where this all begins to make sense. It's no wonder that Jesus goes into this topic of divorce right here in the middle of His sermon, but right after He's been talking about anger, contempt, and lustful fantasy desires. Because just ask yourself, Dallas Willard said in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, just ask yourself, How many divorces really would occur? And in how many cases was the question of divorce ever be risen if anger, contempt, and obsessive fantasy desires were eliminated? Answer, most of them. But because of the hardness of our hearts, because of the hardness of our hearts, God makes allowances for divorce, simply to prevent greater harm. And that's what lies at the heart of divorce, is the hardness of the heart. The heart is capable of such good and such unbelievable evil that the provision is literally there to save the other's life. Because the hardness can turn to abuse and violence and worse. In those days, you would need a certificate of divorce. The woman would, because it only talks about the woman, right? How utterly stilted it is. But so that she might again possibly marry, so that she might receive benefits from the storehouse, or that so she might, this is in there, lay, legally take up the occupation of prostitution. Because otherwise, she would be left to die, literally, in the street. So you can't, you can't tell me that this is the way God would design life for anyone. And to this, Jesus says, no. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. He's raising the bar because the trauma of divorce is not unilateral. It's not one-sided. It damages the spouse, the family, the children, and respectively the entire community. He raises the bar and shows the effects to be so damaging Because those who live in his kingdom do not turn to divorce to solve their problems from their spouse or from their brothers and sisters. So what do we do with all this in 2015 at the top of the hour and only a few minutes to get through it? If you want a better marriage quickly, here's some quick advice. You want a better marriage? 
Anyone here want a better marriage? Let's see it. All right. How many here have tuned out because I've been meddling a little too much? <laughs> if you want a better marriage, get closer to Jesus Christ. Anyone here found that to be true? Anyone say that's just crackpot crazy? Anybody? No. Put away your anger. Put away your contempt. Put away your lust. Second, if you find yourself unable to do the things above, ask for help. But people here would love to help you. Number three, many people whose marriage is on the rocks usually, if any, have few other healthy relationships in their lives. Live out quiet, isolated lives of desperation. Find other couples to intentionally spend time with because this stuff rubs off. I learned to be a better married person by hanging around people who were married. Marriage is something I thought was better off than, than ours. And we didn't want a divorce. We just didn't have the tools to be married people. Anyone else in that bag? Yeah. Therefore, put away disposable relationships. This simply means refuse to walk away from your spouse, but also from your brothers and sisters in Christ, and lean into the differences and ask yourself quickly, which of these problems do I have are, are based in anger, contempt, or out-of-control desire? Then simple. Repent. What does that mean? It means turn around. Turn back to God and face Him with all of your junk and give it back to Him. Every message Jesus preaches begins with repent, the, king, the good news has come. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not that hard. Ask for forgiveness. It's something in life you can't get without asking for with the Father and your spouse and your brothers and sisters. Not only ask for forgiveness, but be generous with your forgiveness and look to the cross because even in his agony alone on the cross, bearing all of our shame and sin, he pled with the Father. He begged the Father for the forgiveness of the perpetrators of this against him. And trust him that he'll sustain you, that he can heal your relationship, and that he can help you. Trust him with your marriage and with your spouse and with all your relationships and your home and your work and your neighborhood and your church. But finally... If divorce has touched your life, know this. Way too often in church life, we view divorce as some kind of scarlet letter, a permanent demotion to second class. I want you to know something. I want you to know this morning that God is not mad at you. In fact, the God of the universe identifies with you. Hold on, we're wrapping this up. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, Jehovah Yahweh, the God of the universe, says, I, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. Yet I saw that her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery. Tom, what are you saying? What I'm saying is if I asked this room right now and God himself was seated in this room right now, who of you have been divorced, please stand to your feet. The Jehovah Yahweh, God of the universe, would stand to his feet and would self-identify him as a divorcee. But the beautiful thing is the story didn't end there. The entire Bible is the unfolding of this great romance and troubled relationship between God and His people. How He bridged the gap and how He restored the relationship through humbling Himself and coming into our world and living perfectly and dying and loving completely and opened the door of the way to His kingdom and then took upon Himself on the cross 
all the fault, guilt, shame, torment, alienation, rejection, abuse, pain, horror, and cause of the broken relationship, our sin done by you and me. He took it on himself. He took all of it to restore our divorced from God's selves into his indescribable love, grace, and mercy. And it gets even better. On the third day, he arose from the grave in power and glory to destroy the power of sin. He took the fault of the sin we've done, and now he comes to destroy the power of sin done against us. So that no longer do we have to be the victim of sin, but to overcome sin through his resurrection. That's how by his stripes we are healed. In other words, in the cross, God forgives all the sin, all the sin done by you, and in the resurrection, he overturns all of the sin done to you. Because you might be here, dwarfs, and say, it, it just really wasn't my fault. He's taken care of that as well. So today, if divorce is in your past, let him use that pain and sorrow. Allow him to let it be a new set of lenses through which you can see God's glory. And if you're in the midst of a tormented situation today, and if divorce seems lurking on the horizon, reach out for help. We're here for you. Trust him like Jesus trusted him when he went to the cross. Know that nothing can ever separate you from the love of God which is in Christ. We're here. We can help. Grab me after the service. I'll be in the back. Uh, other pastors and leaders would love to help you. And if today you recognize that you have unfriended the Savior, if you click that unfollow button and you want His love, His restoration, His forgiveness, His kingdom, look to Him today. Look to Him with the simple truth of because of what Jesus did, please accept me. And the divorce from God can be erased for eternity. And He'll accept you and receive you back into His family with open arms. Bow your heads with me. I know this morning this message has ranged all over and drawn some quick, sharp conclusions. But if in your heart of hearts you say, I'm one who's been divorced from the Father. I want to be restored to my Father. I, I, I want to trust Him with His gift of grace and receive His salvation today. If that's you, I'm not going to ask you to do anything but this real quick. If that's you, I want to pray with you. Just quickly slip your hand. Up, I want to pray with you. And I see that hand. Well, let's pray. Father, how grateful we are today for your kingdom coming, your will being done of restoring all this lost and broken and alienated and divorced from you back into your loving, caring, healing, restoring forgiving arms. God, I pray for this one who raised their hand. I pray for the rest of us facing rocky relationships in our home, with our brothers and sisters at work. Help us this week, oh God, in light of the dramatic changes public now in our society, made official by the Supreme Court. Let this be opportunities of redemptive conversations, not causes for further division. Help us to use this time to be your missionary people in a world that's quickly becoming more like the Bible days than in our yesterdays. Help us to trust you fully and completely with every hurt and harm. Thank you that you care for us. Now I ask that you'd go with each and every one of us as we part company now with the firm knowledge 
of your love for us. This I pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. And together God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go and God bless you. It's good to be